Thank you for listening to the Allender Center podcast. I'm Dr. Dan Allender. And I'm Rachel Clinton Chen. We're fiercely committed to providing hope and healing to a fragmented world. And restoration for the heart. Thank you for joining us. Let's get this conversation started. All right, we're in Advent, and it is such a complex and rich season as we've been talking about, Rachel. And we wanted to do an episode on what we most want people to buy for Christmas. Uh, And I had the privilege of reading a book this summer in manuscript form. And as soon as I read the book, it was like, oh, I know what I want people to buy for Christmas. Normally, what I say is provide people experience. Like, you know, instead of just buying a sweater, uh, buy your adult daughter three meals where you get to engage her regarding eh, her life or something you read together. And when Becky and I had the privilege of reading uh, a new book, and I'll tell you the author and the book in a moment, we had conversations that were so rich. In one sense, here's a purchase that opens the door to an experience, and that is conversations uh, about Scripture, about ourselves, about Jesus, that were some of the richest we've had. So let me introduce uh, a dear friend, Blaine Eldridge. And Blaine, welcome to our podcast. Dan, Rachel, thank you. That is one of the most generous introductions I've ever received. <laughs> so it is good to be here. Thank you both. Well, I, I, I have said and will say again, it, it's one uh, of the best books I've ever read in my life. Uh, it, it, if not the best, certainly in the top two or three. And that experience of reading uh, a, a book that is extraordinary, uh, and then to have known you since you were knee high to some insect, um, uh, it's just an incredible privilege uh, to uh, know you, love you, and also now be able to talk about a labor that is just remarkable. So, Rachel, I'd love to get your experience of reading what is called The Paradise King. And I love the subtitle. The subtitle goes on beautifully. The tragic history and spectacular future of everything according to Jesus of Nazareth. Isn't that just a stunning title? I love it. And you know what's funny, Blaine, I have to confess, because I know enough of Dan's fondness for you and your brothers and your family. So he came back from time with your parents, but also we were pondering and he said, I know a podcast I want to do. And it's about this book that Blaine's written. And he said to me, I honestly think I would put it in like the top two of five of favorite books of all time. And I thought that is really high praise coming from Dan Allender, because I know this man is a voracious reader. Yeah, Is that the right word? Voracious? Is that a word? I think so. that, I, okay. I eat a lot of books. Okay. So no, not the right word, but I think you know what I mean. <laughs> Beyond voracious into the pathological. <laughs> yeah. So I'm like, you know, a part of me was like, okay okay, like, do you feel this way? Because I know how much you love this person. You know, it's like when you think your child is like the most beautiful child in the world, or do you feel this way because something really stunning has been written? I took, I took Dan seriously. So I was very excited to spend time with your book in anticipation of this time with you. And I just want to say, I think it's going to go in, in my like top five favorite books. So I actually have a biblical studies degree. I have a master of divinity. I love the Bible, hate the Bible, wrestle with the Bible, but I grew up Southern Baptist in the text. Like I would just say like rich deposits of the word live in my bones. And so I have had a lot of experience getting to like see the text opened and understand that like Genesis was written in an ancient Near East culture, you know, like just all the things. So I've had a lot of privilege 
for the text to become open and the stories to capture me. I don't know if I've ever been captured by what's happening in Genesis in quite the way I'm captured by how you wrote. And I am a lover of all things fantasy and sci-fi and, and like really getting into like the textures and and a scene. And I just want to say thank you because I feel Mm -hmm. like the, I mean, obviously you're an incredible storyteller, but the, what's the word I'm looking for? Like the, the like seriousness and yet like imagine like the, the marriage of the left and the right brain and how you have written this, like, I know I'm going to spend more time with this and move through it even more slowly. Like on one hand, I could keep reading all night long. And on the other hand, I had to be like, no, I'm going to stop. I really want to take this in. I want to spend time with the different scenes. And I find myself both like curious, even more curious about the history, but mostly more curious about God and more curious about my own heart. So I can wholeheartedly highly recommend this book. I think it would be an incredible gift to the people in your life. And I think it would be something really powerful to read together out loud with the people in your world. So thank you, Blaine. <laughs> Absolutely. And, and, and Blaine, honestly, we're going to eventually let you talk, but we just, will. just, just bear with us. I, I want to read a little section uh, and it it's, from Genesis 1, 26 through 30, Adam and Eve were naked as daffodils. That alone freaked me out. It's like, I love daffodils. And it couldn't have been a better flower to have picked. Naked and to one another, they seem like shaded pavilions or the cool shady places corn provides when it outstretched leaves make cathedrals. Intrigue they held yet no secrets, mystery, yet no fear. They were what they seemed to be, and they worked in the garden with God, discovering together what every plant and animal and even stone should be. But I'm a writer, and this is so, I just one paragraph brings me to a point of going, glory to God glory to God. Naked as daffodils. Oh, God. I hope you hear yourself and you hear God loves sex and some of your other work. <laughs> because to get to naked as daffodils required a lot of contemplating John Paul II, a lot of reading you and your boy Tremper, a lot of trying to imagine what it would be like to have bodies that were transparent windows to the inner self and the kind of erotic intimacy, even intellectually passing through one another. And yet what it would be like relationally to still hold unknown reserves, trying to put words to the reality of transparency and mystery can somehow go together in the human future. So all of that got distilled over time into a couple lines that were really fun to write. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We're going to come back. As I said, this is a bizarre beginning because literally we usually let a guest talk, but it's almost (laughs) like we cannot not talk about you but hold off anything rachel you want to read yeah and i it's gonna just bear with me dan because you know i'm not one to have brevity okay so i'm not this may may be one of the podcasts that goes on for 90 minutes i know i just i'm gonna read a section that might be slightly longer than what you read but i i just i just want to give people a taste of what's in here so it won't be like forever just bear with me okay Uh, you know thank you for the warning yes so Blaine is writing about the story of Moses. So this the setup is this is the second visit to Pharaoh of Moses and Aaron. And so I'm just going to read this little section. Knock, knock, knock. Its tread was conspicuous. From behind the throne, ranking magicians appeared. Egypt's gods, you can be sure, leaned in to hear what Moses and Aaron would say. They didn't say anything. Instead, Aaron held out his staff. He set it upright on the paving stones. Then he stepped back. The staff fell slowly and did not bounce. One ignorant spectator laughed, but he didn't laugh long because all at once a sound rang out and the sound was a roar and the roar came from the staff. 
go back a bit, several months before, when Moses was still incognito in the Arabian desert, he saw a shrub on fire. He went over to look with the, uh, and the angel of the Lord appeared to him in the midst of the flames. They spoke, and the angel told Moses, throw down his staff. He did, and it became a na, na how do you say that? Nakash is how I would Nakash. say it. Okay. <clears throat> a, Nakash, a remembrance of the snake in the Garden of Eden. Moses fled. Not so this time. Moses and Aaron were still when the staff roared again. They were quiet when wonder entered the room. The staff twisted and swelled and grew. At last, in the presence of Pharaoh, a dragon appeared. A dragon! I know what you're thinking, that it was a snake. A cobra with a cool patterned hood. That's possible. It could be a venomous snake, face to face with Pharaoh, who was dressed like one such thing. But that's not what the story says, or what it implies. The word is tannin, which is usually translated sea monster. In Job, it is the monster who swims in the deep. In Psalms 74.13 is the creature whose head God crushed before the creation of the world. It is a very particular snake, a manifestation of chaotic darkness. There was a hush in the presence of Pharaoh, a darting of eyes. Everyone with a half-decent cosmology knew what it meant. The gauntlet was down. A unique God had come. A God who could summon the monster that swam in the murk of the unmade world and turn it into a twig again. What for? For more than harsh labor, and even for more than a land and a people. The tannin was a relic from the beginning of time. It signaled a contest for the end of time. It was like an old champion signing up for a tournament, or a stranger buying into high-stakes poker game, or an old nation going to war. You want the world, Yahweh in effect said. Very well. Let's see who can win it. But of course, no empire falls easily. Hmm. Oh, that was so good. Thank you, Rachel. <laughs> so let, let's just summarize. This, this is an extraordinary book by an extraordinary author who's talking about an extraordinary presence, Jesus, through the Old Testament and into the New. But what I would say is the glimpse that you give is a, an interplay between the biblical text and the imagination of how these stories can be engaged in almost uh, behind the scenes. Uh, the, the, the word is there, but also you're taking us into the context, the ancient Near East, but also into your imagination as to how things might have played out. So it, it is this rich historical fiction, but also built uh, on the beloved word of God. So uh, Blaine, now talk. Tell us uh, how you're reacting to what we're saying, first of all. And also, we want to know how you came to write this. Mm -hmm. Thank you both. I'm a little uncomfortable and very pleased. So <laughs> I am so happy, though, given, honestly, the amount of prayer, predominantly from my wife, that went into the writing of this book, that it would display the beauty of Jesus. So to have that happening is pretty incredible. A little backstory might be helpful because uh, what this story is, is Jesus knowing the particular language of my heart and knowing how to get through to one ordinary person. I tell a bit of the story in the introduction, but you get the, the truncated version. Sure. So here's the full version. Several years ago, I am at my kitchen table. It's actually my parents' kitchen table because at that point and still now, a lot of my furniture is borrowed. So I have their kitchen table in my house and I'm reading Daniel 2. Daniel is an incredible story. Daniel 2 starts, this is an approximation, something like 2-1, uh, in the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams. His spirit was troubled and his sleep left him. It's a pretty good beginning to a story, but you have to add on, it just happened at this time that I had been reading because I like that kind of thing a little bit about the Neo-Babylonian Empire, which is an incredibly human story. If you had to design an antagonist 
for one of the world's great conquerors, you would pick Shin Shereshkin, the Mede, and you would oppose these two diabolical personalities. Even the clothes they wear are fascinating. So something in my heart comes alive when I'm looking at the Saka people uh, in the region of Kazakhstan, kind of on the border of Mesopotamia and the fabric and the patterns and the textiles. And so I've been reading about that. And all of a sudden, here's Nebuchadnezzar. In a story, slouched on a throne, he's sitting there in Daniel 2. And something happened, okay? There was uh, another intriguing character, early 1800s, uh, Con- Cardinal John Henry Newman. And he, by the time this guy is 14, okay, he's reading Hume and disagreeing, and he can see the flaws in the argument of the Scottish philosopher. So can we say an actual genius, not a pretend genius? And by the time he starts writing books to help people on their way to directly encountering Jesus, he thinks that humans have what he calls the illative sense, I-L-L-A-T-I-V-E, the illative sense. And it's our ability baked into us to perceive when we are in the presence of something holy. And it actually goes beyond that. It's our ability to stand in the presence of beauty and perceive the fabric of reality, to perceive Mm -hmm. the grain and momentum of the universe that gets through to us in moments of peace, of moments of rapture, honor, even grief and tragedy, it turns on. Mm -hmm. Well, all I can say is, for reasons I do not know why, Several years ago, reading a story, I knew the illative sense turned on to 11. Mm. And there was such a strong sense of momentum and power in the biblical story. It blew my hair back. Now, the other thing is, that was one of the worst seasons of my life. Mm -hmm. And you have to know that the flip side is, you know, that was the season We've had six miscarriages. Two have, were particularly brutal. One was this year, and one was about uh, six years ago. And the brutal ones happened late. Mm-hmm. And our first late one was around 20 weeks. Oh, goodness. And it, we, it was one of those things where we started to think it was happening because Emily was just reporting something's wrong. Well, the day before the bleeding started, we were in the bathroom and my two-year-old came in and grabbed Emily's hand and said, mom, baby, bye-bye. And we knew then what was coming. There was so, and then later that year was the death of my best friend and who, you know, we had a weekly phone call one week. uh, I knew he wasn't doing well. I came up from the call and told Sam, every time I get off the phone with Garrett, I'm afraid the next call is going to be something terrible has happened. Three days later, I got the second call. Uh, And that season was so brutal. Uh, But I hadn't really tended to my internal world, which is a thing that I am only now learning how to do. Um, But the uh, the cost was there in the background. So it surfaced almost at the exact same time in the book of John. And very similar story. And it might have been a week later. I'm sitting at the same table reading John. John has speeches in it. Uh, You may know it's organized around a series of miracles and long dialogues. And I'm in the middle of one of those speeches. And then all of a sudden I stop and the rage has turned on. And the only thing that I can bring myself to say is I don't get you and you don't come off very well in your own story. But underneath those words was a reservoir, a dam breaking of fury and pain. And you know what? Screw you, man. I think I'm done with this. And, you know, Frederick Buechner in the Gospel is Tragedy, Comedy, and Fairy Tale is a great line. 
if you are our father in heaven, would you please be our father in hell? Because hell is where the action is. So I'm at the table. I'm in one of the most painful seasons just in terms of ruined dreams. Um, to that time, to date, this unexpected confession comes up. And then hopefully our friends listening know these moments where you realize God is listening. These moments lace the biblical story, and whenever they happen, I get kind of electricity on my skin. Hannah weeping and the priest rebuking her and then noticing, wait a second, God is listening, is one of those moments. God was listening. And I'll tell you what I felt. It wasn't, um, I get it, or I love you, my son, or I know this is hard. There are a lot of kind things that Jesus could have said. What I felt was, go look. And for me and the way that I am wired, there could not have been a better dare from God. You're wondering who I am and what this story is. Well, at precisely the right time, this sense of curiosity regarding the biblical story as a portrait of reality has emerged. And I'm pretty done, pretty done. So I took Jesus up on the dare. And the great thing about it was it's the language of my heart, which is I love reading old stuff, as I said. And I really like the Bible and I hate the Bible, like you said, Rachel. And, um, but I like that it serves the goal of revealing Jesus, who is the main character of reality. And in the process of reading for this book, I didn't know what I was going to write. I was just reading for myself and to try to stay alive in that season. And the experience was one of being blown back in my chair over the psychological drama, the intelligence. I think that when you tell most people Old Testament, complex portrait of the supernatural, intellectual sophistication is not like the first thought thing you think. When you say Plato, people think great human mind. But when you say the peculiar professor who gets to be the narrator of Ecclesiastes, who names the problem of evil, I think much more poetically, hundreds of years before Plato is the same Republic. It just doesn't come <laughs> up. And so I'll play this. I was shocked that it was smart. And also that it was moving. And also, you know, the dragon scene that you read, it's not that much harder with Run to the Miraculous for a staff to turn into a dragon versus a snake or for a story to make a point that makes sense. This isn't a, a magician's contest. <laughs> this is a competitive move over the destiny of humanity. And it's signaled by a God who loves the dramatic. You can think there are so many different things that could have been done to initiate the war with the gods of Egypt. And instead, you're watching and as this swelling thing happens, you know, if you are an ancient person or a person who reads ancient people, you know that the Tiamat, the ancient chaos dragon, features quite prominently in the imagination of the ancient world, including the audience, the contemporary audience of that story. So all of a sudden, Tiamat shows up in the story and some kind of character has arrived who evidently has the power to make that thing appear at will. You must be dealing with a being of another order of existence. It just must be something else is happening because anyone can do a miracle, but to summon the chaos monster is pretty special. Amazing. <laughs> well, it, 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 as you talk, it, it, just to underscore it, the tragedy and drama, and it's uh, heartbreaking, 
heartbreaking story. And uh, I know your good friend. I had the privilege of being in the van with him on the way to your wedding. So it is not a mere figure. Um, it is someone whom I had the privilege of being with for at least a number of hours. So the, your own heartache uh, prompts Jesus to create a dare. Um, it, you do have a sense, as you have put it, that the, the drama you're exploring is a drama that originated because of your own willingness to join that drama. Is that a fair way of putting it? Yeah, I would say the, the interplay of the kindness of God and there being enough to respond. And one thing I love reading Pope John Paul is when he takes swings at total depravity. Uh, those of us who grew up you know, in what I call the splash zone of the Protestant Reformation, Rachel knows. Uh, we know all about that. And then you get a mind. You get a, a soul like Nicholas Wolpia explaining, how is it, friends, that humans departing the garden are portrayed as totally depraved and have you noticed that the curses relate to the creation panels of one to six structure the world and fill it with with life that the mandate has not been removed it is simply difficult and that the ability to create life remains in people even to see and speak to god there is so much that remains often in a better ruined state that is accessible to God, that desires him and is for him. So some of that stuff, I think being intact, uh, you know, what is it in the person? We see so many people make so many bad decisions, but what is it in the person when you see that friend of yours make a really great decision to end the relationship or stay in the relationship, to leave the job, to move, that you go wow, God is still living in there. And that was a great thing. So I think in the pain, there is at least a little bit of that uh, left to respond to an invitation to look at the offer of Jesus, look at the picture of Jesus and try to make uh a fair decision on, you know, John, who I like very much now. <laughs> um, well, you guys know, you're biblical scholars, so you know that the Gospel of John comes quite late and that John is quite old when he writes it. And that he has, uh, you and me, Rachel, we're friends and we're not brevity people. Um, <laughs> and so it takes me, you know, 1,200 words to begin to know what I want to say. I'm well, here for it. Keep yeah, going. John is not like that. John is the, uh, you know, the, the witty king. And when he says, in him was life, and that life was the light of humanity, and then he has the restraint not to say anything else. Drops one line in there. He is fully capable of unpacking, but knows that it would be better to let you go, what do you mean? You're saying that there's something about this person that makes sense of the human condition. What is it? He doesn't tell you. He just starts telling you stories and invites you to come see what that is. So Jesus really is that incredible, guys. Uh, he is better than we think, more active, more beautiful, and then just more intelligent than we think he is, which is the main point of this book, uh, an invitation to come and see who Jesus is in terms of the story that has been tasked with revealing him and just see whether or not his character stands up to scrutiny. Well, 
there's always a place for a mic drop. This just <laughs> happens to be one. <laughs> Rachel, where are your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I, I think I find myself like, it's a rare person to, again, love going in deep dives in history, but also loving to paint pictures with language and imagination to like, make the colors more vibrant to pull forth like what's there. Because again, I've already said this, but I'll just say it again. It's like, I've read these stories my whole life and I've loved them. I have found them compelling. They have, after reading how you wrote them, like, I feel like, oh man, they were so flat. There was so much I was missing, which I've known. Um, you know, there's that, f I don't know if you've seen this funny meme and Andrew, if we have to like edit this out because it puts an explicit on the <laughs> podcast, but you know, there's a funny meme going around. That's basically like 2000 years from now, people are not going to know the difference between like a butt dial and a booty call. And that's why reading scripture is hard. Um, the sense of like, there's so much cultural meaning held in language, like the way you talk about, you know, it would have been in the, this dragon would have been in the cultural imagination. And it does feel like so much is lost. Um, but I still find myself marveling. Like I hear you in that there was a gauntlet thrown down for you to explore, to, to put to test in many ways, the character of, of Jesus for you, for your family, for your friends. Um, but I, I guess I still find myself like, when did you fall in love with stories, ancient stories, <laughs> you know, complex histories? How did this come to be? And I don't know if you have an answer to that, but that's where I find myself just still like, you do know this is strange, right? Like this is, you know, there are a lot of historians, but very few who want to take the history and allow it to really mean something. Wow. Thank you. Well, I'll just say back that given the art and the essential oils and the book titles that are behind your head right now, Rachel, you're a fairly unusual, intriguing person yourself. What kind of person uh, could be shot right back? So fortunately, <laughs> uh, the body of Christ is non-competitive. <laughs> so, but let me, there, there are two things that might be helpful because my friend and editor, Josh, took a point from our boy, Dan, when he said, after releasing this book, you should write some essays telling people how to be curious about story in general, and then how to be curious about their story, how to cultivate the faculty of wonder. And one of the first things that I'll say is that um, – these are faculties that can be cultivated or diminished. I mean, if you've looked at any, surely you have, Dan. It's fascinating, but of the research on the neurobiology of joy and that you can mm. destroy the center, the reflection of joy in the human body, or you can cultivate it and grow it. Or happiness, you know, Louis Boimersky or Hayter, these people who say, man, an incredible amount, you know, Emotions are morally significant because we can do so much to change them. Yes. Well, wonder is a thing that can be cultivated or starved. Part of the tragedy of late modernity is that is the assassination of wonder, the ridicule mm. of joy and the numinous. So is task one with liking the Bible or ancient history is having a heart that's alive. Mm. Um Ta then task two, it, I would say come back in history and look at two trends. One is I have unusual parents who I love, who are so bizarre, and they love theater and writing and my mom was the chair of the feminist club at her Southern California State University back in the day, uh, shared offices with a black student union, passionate person. So growing up, 
is, there are advantages, guys. And to grow up in a culture that really loves stories in general. Mm-hmm. I read quite a bit about parenting right now. I have a three-year-old and a seven-year-old, and I'm so struck by the fact that what the children can detect the unspoken value system of the family in a way that's disturbing. Oh, yeah. um, so I started <laughs> to ask my seven-year-old, what does our family care about? Because <laughs> I think you probably know better than me. And <laughs> what do we love? And what you love as parents will do far more to shape your children than anything else. So my, I did have a family that really loved story and doing Shakespeare and memorizing the monologues and giving them to each other. And then, and then as also one of those people who seems to be born with just a profound sense of inadequacy. And the, for decades, the solution is perform or die. The interesting thing about this is that uh, kind of, I, my theory on this right now is like the wounds of Christ. I love what Christianity has to say about evil, that it's bad. It's not epiphenomenal. It's not an illusion. It's bad. And the presence of God has the miracle working power to bring resurrection in something Mm. that is utterly awful. Mm. So there is a sense in which profound sense of inadequacy being behind something wrong, which leads to a kind of driven, not quite perfectionism, but which is different is performancism and performance is just read what's valued in the community and the culture and get good at that, whatever it is. Well, I happen to be in a place that really liked reading philosophy and old books. And I was in and out of homeschool culture. And so I started reading the Iliad really early. I, started reading Greek mythology in the first grade and um, and also loved it. So that over time, as God, through many channels, marriage, counseling, church, has uh, addressed some of the inadequacy, there is still uh, a lot of time hmm. spent with Seneca, spent with Cicero and my brothers and I would act out the history of the Roman Empire on the street on Choke Cherry Bell. <laughs> and we would start, you know, Romulus and Remus, and we would play our way kind of through to the end. And my younger brother and I would be the emperors, the co regents, and then we'd like kind of start over. So the Back in the story is the weirdness and is the attraction and then just a love of story. You know, C.S. Lewis has so many, so much good stuff on making people love story. Like, make kids love reading by forbidding them to read and then giving them lots of opportunities to disobey. <laughs> one of my ideas I, I, so I, made this, I think one of the ways to make the Bible interesting is I want an untranslated edition of Daniel on a shelf somewhere and when my kids find it and that's what it is I'll say oh, this is nothing don't don't look at that don't, don't go there and then, don't, they'll, look, no. and they'll see these odd ancient characters that in the middle of that book you know switch languages and then change back and they'll be like what is this and maybe offhandedly mention oh it's it's an ancient work of prophecy it, doesn't matter. It's nested inside a story about some deportees in Babylon. Don't worry about it. <laughs> oh, it happens to be a prophecy that is used by Jesus to, of Nazareth to interpret his life and mission, but just don't mess don't, with it. Don't bother. So I under, you see in the story that I do love stories. Again, to Lewis, he says that he would prefer on the bus seeing people reading uh, cheap science fiction 
than grinding their way through the classics, hating them. Because the first person has a spark of delight that can eventually spread to other things. So I'll say ancient stuff is weird, guys. It's so, one of my metaphors, I haven't used this very much, but uh, so we'll see how it goes. But I was trying to explain ancient Jewish commentary. And I said, it would be kind of like learning you know, seeing a superhero movie and then learning that there was this giant canon of things called comic books and going back to look at them and seeing how labyrinthian and insane they are and confusing and oftentimes just utterly esoteric and bizarre. A lot of Second Temple literature is like that. It takes a while to get oriented to how do these things work? exactly what's the genre what are we using to communicate but enough time back in ancient world land and the lights do start to come on and then when Enkaidu is giving the speech to Gilgamesh when he's dying all you know I start reading it to my wife crying and she wasn't quite getting it but she tries I was like listen how beautiful this is listen how beautiful this is Enkaidu or Enkidu how do you want to say it is wakes up you know, and he's going to die and Gilgamesh is there and he says, listen, my friend, hear the dream I dreamed last night. I was in the realm of the dead and all the crowns of the world were gathered in heaps. Here and there scurrying were those who used to wear them. Now they bring the dead their food. And I saw the eyes of the two-headed man bird and Arish Kigal. She looked at me and asked, who is this? And I awoke. Now, you don't feel anything reading that. I mean, do what I did and get into counseling. Um, (laughs) Wonder is there for the taking. (laughs) Now, Rachel, just as a quick aside before we end, is there any question why I have had such a privilege of watching Blaine grow up? Because even as a fifth, sixth, seventh grader, uh, he far exceeded uh, my capacity to hold the illative with the imaginative and Mm -hmm. how they bring both in tragedy and heartache and yet in glory and beauty, how the heart begins to draw and be drawn to imagination, which always uh, is ultimately about the paradise king. Mm. So to be able to say all things, all things, all things of heartache, all things of beauty move toward and in and through and completed Mm. by the paradise king. So when we say to you, uh, you know, I think as an audience, you know us well enough. We we don't we don't sell many books, and we <laughs> certainly do not sell any book that we have not read. But this happens again to be one where I would say you will have conversations that uh, are rich, are compelling, uh, but indeed draw you to the one that this season and our lives are all about. So to say to you, Blaine, uh, it seems, shall we say, uh, very inadequate, but thank you. Thank you. Thank you for allowing a war of your soul uh, at your parents' table to take us to the glory of the king. Uh, It is a labor of such love that if you love those whom you gift, uh, I will say again, this will be a gift that you'll want to give because of that love. So Blaine, we will have you back because I do need to explore with Rachel and you the interplay between the illative and imagination, Mm. just saying at some point. (laughs) I'll look forward to it. Thank you. I am going to give you, because I have been well-trained by the likes of Dan Allender, a serious, uh, you're welcome, Dan. It it felt like such a privilege to write. I remember watching you at the Restoration Conference when people would say the back and forth of, thank you for reading. 
thank you for your book. And then you say, thank you. You took it with you and you wrote a new story and you brought it into your life. And then there's this reciprocity that is additive. Um, and so thank you, Dan, for reading it. Thank you, Rachel. Also, thank you for reading. Uh, I wish you had been available when I was doing the audiobook. That was so good. I do. I did have a lot of fun reading that, but you wrote it. So it was very easy to like feel it. <laughs> so thank you both for the honor of this conversation. Thanks for listening to the Allender Center podcast. If you're gaining new insights through the topics we're covering in this podcast, we invite you to deepen your understanding of your story by working through one of the self-paced online courses offered by the Allender Center. If you'd like to engage your personal story and explore how the goodness and pain in your life has shaped you, we recommend starting with To Be Told, the online course led by Dr. Dan Allender. You can enroll for To Be Told or any other online courses at theallendercenter.org slash online dash courses. Oh, and one more thing. When you subscribe to our newsletter, you'll be the first to know about new offerings, events, and sales. Visit theallendercenter.org slash subscribe to join our mailing list today. Thanks again for listening, and we'll see you back here next time. Center podcast is produced by the Seattle School of Theology and Psychology. If you'd like more information about the Allender Center, you can look at theallendercenter.org.